Hello, and welcome to Bluestream, bringing Willamette to you. My name is Tiffany Newton, and I'm the Director of Parent and Alumni Engagement here at Willamette. Today's conversation features Carol Long, who serves as Provost and Senior Vice President here at Willamette University. In her role, she for, focuses on enhancing collaboration among the four now colleges of Willamette University and between student and academic affairs. Provost Long spent over 30 years at Willamette as a professor of English. During that time, she also served as department chair, associate dean, and dean in the College of Liberal Arts, now the College of Arts and Sciences, before leaving in 2009 to work at the State University of New York College at Geneseo. As provost and interim president, she then returned to Willamette, we're so thankful, in August of 2016. Our discussion today will focus on the power of the written word and some of her selected books that change lives, at least from her perspective and those of her <laughs> students, with our main themes being abstraction, place and description, and mystery, along with a few other fun surprises thrown in as well. Provost Long, thank you so much for joining us this evening to talk about your love of reading, the books that have helped shape your approach to the world and those of your students, and we just can't wait to dig in. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tiffany. Happy to be here. Of course. So to start off, I'm going to start with kind of an, an opener question before we get into the main themes. I know that we're going to talk about books that have impacted you in your teaching and in your life, but I wonder if you could start with just a little brief kind of glimpse into when you first fell in love with literature, with reading. Um, and where did this journey start for you? Uh, sure. Well, I suppose I have to start with my mother. You know, what did we all start with? But um, I, so I'm a first gen college kid. I, my Nobody else in my family has done what I've done. Um, bless them. <laughs> They're probably smarter than I am. <laughs> um, but my parents were bakers and caterers. And so I grew up in a sort of family business. And mm -hmm. my mother, so my mother, they're from Kansas, all my family, both sides. Um, and my mother and father married in the midst of the depression and were sort of, you know, grapes of wrath people. They, they migrated from Kansas down through Oklahoma and Texas, and then went across the Southwest and ended up in California where I was born in Southern California. And my mother graduated from high school. My dad only got through eighth grade mm -hmm. and mom wanted to be an English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I've lived out her fantasy life, I guess, you know, but she read to me all the time. Um, we would go into Los Angeles, downtown to Los Angeles, to the, the food markets and the flower mm -hmm. markets and stuff. And she'd always take me to all the big bookstores in town and buy stuff, you know, old books. Um, and she would turn me loose in libraries. I, she never restrained me in the children's reading room or anything. <laughs> so so I, I became a pretty omnivorous reader, um, uh, which I think has really formed me for the rest of my life. I always say that I became an English major because I learned really early that as an English major, I could study anything I wanted to because, <laughs> you know, a book can take you anywhere. So I, I always um, I've always been a generalist and remain one still to this day. Uh, so that that was what happened to me. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful. Well, that you know, I should say one other thing, and some of some of the folks out there may know, a, a, may or may not know a bit of this, but um, I have two daughters. My older daughter uh, had a very adventurous medical life in her high school and early college years. Um, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and the result of that, she's fine, she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. She has my two grandsons. It all had a very happy, you know, outflow. <laughs> but it's um, the beginning experience was quite remarkable because. Um, they removed the, a small tumor that left her with only a left-hand visual field. So if she were looking at you, she wouldn't see your left ear. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so she couldn't, she was a great reader. She was a very, like me, she'd kind of become an omnivorous reader. And when she woke up from surgery, she couldn't read street signs. So I watched someone lose reading for a while, mm -hmm. which impressed upon me once again, you know, what a, what a door that is for people and what gets shared in that mode. I mean, she, she learned to listen. She read upside down for a number of years because reading upside down, she would read into her sight rather than into her blindness. Right. Mm -hmm. So we learned a lot about reading and language. She lost nouns altogether for a while from some pressure in her brain, anomia, so she could tell you what something was, what it did, but she couldn't name it, right? So just looking at language and the brain and sight 
really made me think about this project that we're all in and just the, the pleasure of being able to pick up something and read so easily. And, you know, technology has really helped us. It will read everything to us now. And that's lovely. <laughs> well, and just as you shared that, thank you so much. The accessibility factor that has come from technology, but then also the, the treasure of knowledge that comes from being able to go into a library to access the written word or spoken word, to hear those stories, to delve into situations and life experiences and perspectives so different from your own. I mean, as you said, it, it, the written word can take you anywhere. Space, I'll, I mean, we'll get into that a little bit later, but it really can take you 200 years ago, a thousand, all kinds of things. And so, um, that's amazing. And it also shows her deep love that her tenacity was really to get back into yes. being able to do something that was yeah. so important. And yeah. She's, so. she's raising her two boys now and she reads to them all the time. And the, the, the six-year-old is a pretty good reader. So now she lets him read to her. <laughs> oh, I love that. And now it's gone another generation and you're all book bugs and it'll just keep going. Um, I, and that's wonderful. So in thinking about our first theme you kind of talked about abstraction and I had to look that up to make sure I knew what it was and, and where we would be going, especially based on some of the books that you had kind of put in this bubble. But um, if you could kind of talk about what it means when books can tell you about time and space and things that you can't experience with your five senses, but that are known or that have become known through that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is, I have a pretty abstract head on the whole. And so the, you asked me in one of our conversations, what book first led me to really have a love of reading? And, and my answer was Immanuel Kant. And I thought, well, that's probably not a normal English major, you know, response. But so Kant, I remember, this is a really vivid memory from my middle school years in California. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was serving the Toastmasters breakfasts at the time, and I would go with her before school and help her or not. Sometimes I was probably helpful, other times I probably wasn't. But I remember very vividly sitting on the back porch of the place where she was uh, serving breakfast to the Toastmasters, reading Immanuel Kant. <laughs> now, why I was doing that in middle school, I have no idea. Did I understand what he was saying? Probably not. You know? <laughs> but it was a language talking about the critique of pure reason, right? And talking about what what a priori knowledge is and how you can look at reason detached from sensory experience. And all of that stuff was just really fascinating to me for some reason. I don't know. Um, but it was a language that nobody in my family used. I mean, right, they didn't they didn't talk about that kind of thing. And so it was a whole different way of um, thinking about experience, thinking about reality. It was a, a language talking about abstractions that hadn't really been part of my world and wasn't, you know, wasn't really embedded in the other things I'd been reading. So I think it was, I think at, at that point I was marked as an academic, right? That was the thing that kept me going in <laughs> deeper and deeper <laughs> into the thickets. You know? um, and, and I still remember it with great fondness, actually, that it was so, so cool to have something this weird in my hands. <laughs> Well, and I just love it. What like even if you didn't fully grasp exactly what it meant, with you know a, a grad student kind of understanding <laughs> the fact that it was a weird way of thinking and of knowing yeah. and of talking yeah. about something exactly. was intriguing enough to you to keep turning the pages and keep exactly. diving exactly. in. I'm glad I, I I'm glad I didn't have a test on it when I was done. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that way about a few of my, the books that I was assigned in my different, you know, undergrad and graduate programs. It's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, if I look at that, then what I, what I sort of kept delving into in the actual literature world were books that dealt in some way with that level of abstraction, whether it was metafiction, fiction about fiction, whether it was, um, I, I, you may notice from the list I've given you, I have a propensity to read really long novels which is not particularly normal these days. So, um, but yeah, I still do <laughs> go after the long books that are expansive and that carry on for a long time. And I spent a lot of time really working in science and literature too. So mm -hmm. I team taught with um, uh, David Goodney for years and with others in the science and really in, I, I team taught with um, um, 
a number of artists and estheticians at Willamette through the years too. So I, I, I was always, as I say, a generalist, but the science side with Einstein and others kind of looking at how science and literature interact was always really fascinating to me, which I think comes from that same desire for abstraction. But things like Calvino's Invisible Cities, where, you know, it's imagining places that don't exist, but trying to think about what they mean, right? Or Borges with labyrinths. Um, and then I really liked the people who try and classify all reality. So W.B. Yeats is a vision where he, you know, does the phases of the moon and the hero and the fool and how they interact and how this tells you how all history works, which of course isn't true, but you know. And Gertrude Stein, The Making of Americans is another one, which I, I, I'm not sure I would wish any of you actually go and read that because it's really known as the most unreadable book in American literature and it's 900 and some pages long, so be careful. But what she tries to do is to classify all the different characters that live in the American populace. <laughs> you know, it's a project that's quite fascinating, but she repeats herself a lot. So be careful if you go read it. And then, um, you know, Murakami and Wolf, who put, put um, uh, plots together <laughs> that really work at several levels. You know, that kind of abstraction rather than just the straight uh, experiential, this is a story about the family kind of thing, is what I always ended up following. <laughs> well, and it, it's interesting because from my mind, it's almost like that they're written puzzles in some ways. They're yes. trying to find yeah. all the pieces, fit yeah. everything together, have a framework or a, a means of knowing what they're discussing yeah. in an order to it. But then for things, you know, Albert, I'm like of the whole universe, as if that's something that you can do, but at the same time, he was known for thought experiments and just thinking of things over and over and over again yep. to come mm -hmm. up with different solutions. And it seems like some of your reading is also... It is very much. Yeah. Yeah, very much like that. And I think I was always fascinated with plot because it's the it's the abstraction of the, of the book, right? And so looking at people who are putting the plot together in some interesting architectural way mm -hmm. was, was always fascinating to me. <laughs> I love that. Um, and then the next one that we kind of get into, and of course, I, Ulysses is something that most folks going through high school have at least had some exposure to, yep. um, place and description. And I mean, you, you have books on here from Australia and Canada, Latin America, Africa, the Southern United States. And, and I mean, some of these stories are so rich in how they perfectly capture a time and a sentiment and a perspective. I, I wonder if you could dive into that a little bit. Wow. Yeah. Well, as I, as I thought about how I read and what, you know, what leads me on to the next thing, I will also say I'm a, I'm a, if I start reading an author, I almost always have to read everything they've written, which is sometimes a trial, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's something I do. And the, the same thing happens for me with place. I mean, Joyce, I put at the top because probably the place I've been most, um, lengthily connected with in my reading is, is Ireland mm -hmm. for no good reason. I mean, I don't, my, my grandmother had some Irish background, but that was about it. So, but when I was an undergraduate and looking at going abroad, um, you know, all the other English majors were going to England. So I said, eh, I'll go to Ireland. <laughs> so I ended up in Ireland, which was a delight and <laughs> then ended up doing my graduate work um, often I went to Northwestern because Richard Ellman was there and he was the big Joyce critic. Um, then he left to go to Columbia, so left me high and dry. <laughs> um, but that Irish literature thread has been a really important kind of going back to thing for me for many years. Um, and Ulysses, when I was in Ireland the first time, they still sold Ulysses in a brown paper wrapper under the counter, right? It wasn't available in the, on the bookshelf right? so it was a little risque at the time I was living with a family as a, a boarder and um, there was a one of the children in the family was a high school a young man who was in high school and he knew I was reading Joyce and he asked me if he could borrow a book once I you know being a blithe American I said sure so I handed him the doubleners which I thought would be safe, innocuous, right? <laughs> and I got bawled out by his mother <laughs> for handing him something of choice to read. <laughs> so, you know, anyway, um, Joyce, you know, well, if you if you've all read Ulysses or parts of Ulysses or ever played in Bloomsday in Ireland, I think it, it's 
meticulously based in Dublin and leads you through the entire city in lots of detail. That's one thing it does. Um, I think my project when I was there as an undergraduate was to photograph every place in Dublin that he talked about, which was, I, I don't think I was very successful, mind you, but it was fun. Um, so that sense of place in literature has always fascinated me and that it leads you into trying to understand the culture of the country, trying to understand the history of the country. It gives you all that expansive learning to play in. So Ireland was one of the first places. I, I, I had a passion for Australia for a while. So Miles Franklin, Patrick White, some people like that. Um, I spent, spent a time working with women, in, women writers in Western literature, which led me into Canada. And that was where I found Nellie McClung and Margaret Atwood later on. Um, and then I had a romance with Latin American fiction for a while. Um, one of my mentors as an undergraduate um, had been very deeply tied into Latin American literature too. And so Julio Cortázar was one of the people I had a lot of fun with. He's very, <laughs> very structural in his writing. Um, if you haven't read Hopscotch, it's also a long book, but it has the first 56 chapters or so of that actually tell a normal kind of plot line. And then he has 99 other chapters with some directions for reading that allow you to stick them in in a whole variety of places or design your own. It's kind of like a, you know, make your own adventure reading experience, mm -hmm. but it's really entertaining. And he's, he has lots of, he has short stories. He has lots of other really good things to read, but Hopscotch is kind of the equivalent of Ulysses to, <laughs> um, in his tradition. Um, I probably haven't read as deeply in Africa as I should have, um, but a couple that I've mentioned there, Isak Dennison, who's kind of a, an interloper, Karen Blixen, um, uh, and out of Africa, and then Shinwa Achebe, who is from Nigeria, who tells mm -hmm. things from also talking about the interaction between the colonialists and the residents, um, but from the other point of view, you know, so there's lot, lots to be learned by, by reading deeply in African literature. And then even in the United States, you know, reading from different regions, I spend a lot of time thinking about regional literature, even in the Northwest, um, and our own regional authors who are fascinating and really fun to read. Um, but I learned a lot. I don't know how authentic. But I spent a lot of time reading literature out of the Southern United States, um, Faulkner's Sound and the Fury is sort of my go-to there, but Sora Neale Hurston, Their Eyes Were Watching God, is one that I think I've taught, I don't think I ever taught Immanuel Kant, but I think other than that, I've never taught The Making of Americans, although I've taught Gertrude Stein. I think I've taught, I don't think I've gotten to teach African, but everything else I've gotten to teach. <laughs> mm. Well, and, it, and it's interesting because some of these capture such a specific detailed moment in time, even if it's kind of a, a fictional story, but it, you know, it'll talk about a specific road or a specific place, a specific yep. language, a specific way of dressing, the, the class differences, cultural differences. Exactly. Um, and and it, they're just such uh, time capsules in a way, even if the stories themselves maybe are never really happened or you can pull them exactly. apart and put them back together and make it your own thing as well. But I'm, I'm so impressed when people can immerse you into a specific moment. Yeah, it's wonderful. That's that's what makes reading so great. You know, I, I one of the things that I fret about sometimes in our current reality, which has so much wonderful stuff going on in it and um, opening our eyes to questions of diversity and inclusion and opening our eyes to structural elements of our own culture in various ways or the culture, the, the world itself broadly is, you know, really struggling with questions of equity, questions of governance and democracy or not, you know, there's, there's lots going on. Um, and reading helps us understand all of that. But one of the things I've, I worry about is that we're um, in our, some elements of our identity politics, which does some really good things in, in raising awareness. Um, if we're not able in literature to write about and read about people we don't know, right? Yeah. Or to experiment with trying to write someone else's life, that, that really limits what literature can do. So I hope, I hope we open doors, not close them over the next 20 years. <laughs> well, in 
And it's interesting because there are ways in which the written word can make experts of everyone, but then there are ways in which, you know, people start talking about, oh, that's a step too far, or you're taking something away from more authentic yep. voices. That's and, right. That's right. And, yeah. and then, then you see what's happening with The Handmaid's Tale, and that's a TV show now, and people are thinking, you know, using imagery from that book as a pro- to protest and, and address current political issues, and, yes. and so things can be reinvented and reconnected to the current, to our present reality in ways that you maybe weren't expecting either. That's right. Yeah, very true. And that's yet another exciting thing about the written word, Tiffany. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't escape it and it comes around all the time. Um, so, and I realize that we're kind of going through this fast, but I know that there'll be a lot of questions as well. And I will drop in the chat some of the books because people are already like, oh, I need the list. What are- I need the list, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next one, unless there's anything else that you wanted to kind of dive into in the, the place and description is around mystery. And I know that. Yeah, that's sort of a, so, so I had an aunt named Ruby. Um, mm-hmm. Ruby was um, a spinster and Ruby and her brother, Felix, lovely names from the thirties. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, they sent boxes of mystery books, paperbacks, back and forth for years. So my young life was formed by watching my Aunt Ruby sit by the swimming pool with her ankles crossed, reading mystery novels day and night. (laughs) So I don't think I've ever taught a class in mystery, actually. Um, but I had to put it in because it's it's still so much of my reading. And I love I love a good mystery. Um, I don't like thrillers. You know, that's not me. But just a good mystery that has a good puzzle in it. As you say, I'm a puzzle, puzzle person, I guess. So Earl Stanley Gardner, I put there just because um, that's the era in which my aunt read. So that formed my connection with mystery stories. But for me, people like Louise Penny... Still Life with Inspector Gamache, based in the Canadian settings, right? Wonderful series of books. Donna Leon, Aqua Alta, writing from Venice. Um, and then there's, you know, the, the more standards, Agatha Christie, P.D. James, the British, very, you know, all of the well-to-do, wealthy British people solving mysteries, craziness. Um, and then one I really, I, I, I like to seek out uh, mystery novels that have women investigators mm-hmm. right so Jacqueline Winspear has a series about Maisie Dobbs who forms her own um, investigative service right who's wonderful I, again a little bit you know upper class English but you know and there are there are lots of examples just across the world of different kinds of mystery writers and from from mystery you get you know a kind of different take on a culture it's not engaged in really to try and explain the culture to you, but the culture becomes the backdrop and it, mm-hmm. it helps you um, think through, um, you know, there are good examples in Africa, good examples in the, in the Scandinavian countries. It really gives you a different kind of view, a more colloquial view into the culture. So it's lots of fun. You get to, you get to solve the mystery, but you get to learn stuff too. <laughs> well, and it's also interesting how people solve issues or solve, you know, like how how they approach a problem or how they think about something or slight tweaks in in their morality or or what they think is acceptable or not. Um, and, and it's just it can be fun. It, it's written entertainment in a way to to try yep. and see if you can figure it out before the author kind of yep. points you and, to it. And, and in English language mystery earlier in the like in the early twentieth century, late nineteenth. So many of the women mystery novelists wrote under a, a pseudonym, right? Yeah. Or wrote under a, a male name. Uh, and you get just a lot of interesting gender history through the years in the mystery world, both in the plots and also in the authors themselves. Mm-hmm. And um, Agatha Christie, is, if you haven't ever explored her life, is a fascinating I mean, not only are her mysteries wonderful throughout, but her life is totally fascinating. And she <laughs> spent time, you know, traipsing around many parts of the world, Egypt notably. Um, but she's she's quite an interesting character herself. <laughs> At a time when that wasn't the norm and that, you know, being Absolutely. even, you know, not that she was writing so, so long ago, but I mean, it really wasn't a common occupation or right. profession really for someone, right. let alone to then use that to go explore the world and see things in a different way and claim that space and that voice. And 
yeah. to, to carry on with that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's so fun. So it's interesting because for you, mystery, it seems like that puzzling and the different ways of thinking and the different ways of approaching problems or things that we don't understand and want to increase our, our ways of knowing is kind of how you approach it where I'm one I love big fantasy novels where it, you know it's 300 uh-huh. pages of explaining the world and the mythology of something that doesn't exist and you know yeah. Tolkien or something where it's like oh you can read a whole book about languages and how those are different yep. and how those tie into the different races and and create people that act in certain ways and have certain Absolutely. belief systems. Yeah, um, fantasy is a great genre. I, I almost put science fiction in here too. And mm-hmm. Ursula Le Guin is a, one of my Northwest favorites out of that genre, you know, who used her parents who were anthropologists, like in, in Left Hand of Darkness, right? She used her parents who were anthropologists to give her a, a basis for much of the human landscape that she created, right? Really fascinating, fascinating woman who passed away not too long ago, actually. <laughs> That's a shame. But uh, again, one of the other benefits of books is that we get to keep what these people keep them. produce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. I mean, I mean, we haven't reached the point where we're getting rid of all kinds of books. Like they're even more secure now than they were, but. They um, are. Although the, the book suppression world is active out there right now too. Again, yes. Fahrenheit 451 lives. <laughs> Very true. You know, and when that is most of us first encounter that in junior high or high school, you're like, oh, this just, you know, why are we reading this? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, there was a point. There were people <laughs> who had thought this through and had more life experience than me. I know I went through an experience where in like three years I had read 1984, Brave New World, The Giver, you know, all these things. And you're just like, they just keep coming up with these same themes. And I and now you look at different way, you know, geopolitical issues and stuff, and you're like, okay, they were wanted me to know what <laughs> things could be and, and how those could play out in, in a real life, besides just these long books that I was like, Yeah, oh, very true. Dark. <laughs> very true. Very true. <laughs> but one of the other things that you kind of put in here, and we can have people suggest other things that they've really um enjoyed is. Moomin. And I um, have my grandmother, Minica, had introduced this to me and I was not expecting to see um, these cute little creatures. And I still go up to the Nordic house in, in Southwest Portland and yep. Yep. You know, they have some of that. But um, could you talk about, and <laughs> am I going to say it right, Toby Jansen? And yeah, Tove uh, to- to- Jansen, I think she says. Um, yeah, she. I discovered these, I can't remember when, but when my kids were little. So we started reading them and I've held on to them and I, among the books that I recommend to people, this is the one I probably recommend the most because I mean, children's literature is fascinating as a field in itself, but the, the Moomin Land series, the Moomins, if people haven't seen that, you know, Britain has a whole com- uh, cartoon series of them. Uh, there's a Moomin Land world, like there's a Disneyland, there's a Moomin Land world in Finland. I mean, you know, then they have lots of little products and lots of characters in the Moomin world who are uh, on towels and cups. <laughs> you know, they're very, very commercialized. Um, but the books themselves are absolutely wonderful. And the thing I like about them, and my favorite is Moomin Land Midwinter. They're, they're, these lovely little, you know, troll creatures who hibernate in the winter and there's a world in which they interact that's, it's got spooky things in it. And, but it, it's the most wonderful set of stories because I think un, unlike some, some fairy tales, like the grim fairy tales are pretty dark, right? Mm-hmm. And the Moomins really have a real balance of dark and light. Um, of positive and negative forces in the world. And they mostly, but it's not sappy, right? It doesn't just like always have a happy ending. So it it seems out of the children's literature that I've experienced anyway, it's the most balanced in terms of seeing what life is actually like. <laughs> right? There's a little pragmatism kind of through, I mean, it, 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 you know, as Nordic cultures would have a, a practicality or, a, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really I, I love recommending them to people because they're good for adults, too. Right. We we forget. <laughs> well, and some of the characters, you know, some of them are, are smooth and fluffy and, and stuff. And then there's spiky ones. And they're, you know, they, yes. Yeah. There's a My daughter's one. favorites were, were always little my the little, you know, always dressed in red, really <laughs> vicious little creature. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that's such a handful. No, <laughs> I love. I just love it, and it's some of the emotional intelligence that's shared yes. in those stories in a sim- in a simple way. I don't think too simplistic, but you know, right. to kind yeah. of help children navigate yeah. their own feelings, and you see that across children's literature as well, where maybe they talk about scary things or they talk about new things or different types of families or different types of experiences. And a lot of it is to kind of help children understand that newness and weirdness is something that's okay and that you can work through and that you can understand and then enjoy. And of course, Moomin Troll is always sneaking out of the house. You know, he doesn't hibernate. He gets up when everybody else is asleep and goes and finds other people. (laughs) Yeah, it's all very fun. (laughs) Perfect. You need you need someone with a little bit of of a gleeful kind of disobedience. So not not terrible, but just a little bit. Um, And I just wonder because we've kind of worked through this and we have some questions from other folks, especially different books that they've loved and things that they'd like good. to oh, good. Yeah. on. <laughs> um, but are is there anything else from this list that you kind of want to go back to or that um, we skipped over? Well, I, I, th- I think I, I put a quote at the end of the reading list that you'll mm-hmm. share also. But when you ask why I why I read, right? This is why. So this is Charles Eliot, who was the president of Harvard in 1869, among other things. But I, and I have this on a plaque on my wall. It says, books are the quietest and most constant of friends. They are the most accessible and wisest of counselors and the most patient of teachers, right? And it'll, and you know, he said this before the internet. The internet is pretty busy and they have pop-up ads on it and you know books whatever form you take them in even if it's on your kindle right that they're quiet and constant right Mm -hmm. and they're not always right and you can seek out a whole bunch of different ones of them but that that form of uh sharing information it doesn't replace experience you have to test it out with experience but it can broaden your experience and Mm -hmm. it it gives you a place to go right it gives you a place to go always so. Well, and I like that it can be an individual experience or you can choose to partake in a book club or in a yeah. class or with other folks or share your favorite with a friend and have an argument or a heartfelt conversation <laughs> or, you know, realize you have completely different tastes and you'll be friends about other things. And, <laughs> um, but you can really kind of, again, choose your own adventure, how you want to interact with that yeah. or how you want to... T- to take it or to leave it or to stop reading it or to read every single book by that same author, <laughs> even if some of them might be torturous, um, you know, especially if they're 900 pages or something. Yes, why did you write this? <laughs> Do you not like me? No. Um, but, it, and it's so interesting how something that, you know, an author writes without knowing what the experience will be of their audience can be so personal and so deeply held and beloved or transformational to folks. Um, One of the questions from Linda Lewis is, you know, do you reread favorite books or are there books that you turn to that you kind of come Mm -hmm. again as a friend? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Linda. I, you know, I haven't done a, I mean, I I reread things when I'm really working on them, right? I was thinking about them or teaching them often. Um, But in my just sort of normal life, I don't do a lot of rereading. I'm I'm wondering if I will start doing that because as I looked at these lists, I thought, oh, I've got to read that again. (laughs) So I might have to start doing that. Um, Interestingly, the movement books I have reread, partly probably just for fun right and and I don't I don't reread the mysteries much but I go back to different authors if I haven't read all of them I'll go back and and visit that world again you know um yeah it's it's good I think it's good to reread (laughs) I know for me I sometimes go back to books because they were with me at a certain moment in my life that I really enjoyed or that I want to get back to or it was something a great-grandmother gave me or my mom or you know and so I remember not only that that story, but that moment or that feeling. Right. And so yeah. th- there can be times where you just, you know, love it. I tend to reread poetry more than I reread oh, novels, yeah. interestingly. Okay. I'll go back to a poem 
I think maybe it's because I read long novels. <laughs> <laughs> it's much quicker to, to not to go back to a poem. <laughs> and, and the other thing is now that I'm so getting so aged, right, I'm interested to go back and read some of the books that I really did spend a lot of time with when I was younger, because I bet they'll look entirely different to me, right? They'll mean something different to me now. <laughs> And the perspective and in, in all of the experiences that you can have and to come to it and be like, oh, I never got the author's point here or yeah, exactly it, it, that was too shallow. What were they thinking? You know, yeah, it can be all kinds yeah, of things. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the things that folks have shared is um, they wondered if you had read Sister Fidelma Celtic Mysteries. There are 15 or so of them set in the seventh century. In the seventh century? No, I haven't. Thank Brennan. you. I will go find them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll make sure you get all these notes. I'm sure this, this is going to be an ongoing reading list sharing project. I have a feeling where This is good. Right. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there was, a, sorry, a, oh, favorite, someone asked what your favorite poets might be or a couple of folks that you. Oh, goodness. I have so many. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, my, I cut my teeth on the romantics, so I still go back and read some of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and of course, I started with, you know, Yeats and company. Yeats, Yeats was my go-to poet for many years. Um, I, th I think that I haven't kept up with contemporary poetry as much as I should. So a lot of my poetry is 19th and early 20th century. Okay. Um, uh, Sylvia Plath interested me for a while. Um, I loved the young woman who uh, presented at the inauguration. She was lovely. <laughs> so there, there are there are good things to be had out there. Um, those are the ones that come to mind instantly. Well, and I believe she just had a um, Amanda Gorman was the yeah. American poet at, at the inauguration, and she just right. published a, a book, I believe, of some of her. Mm -hmm. that has come. It's on my list. Like I have an ongoing list. And I'm taking list. notes yeah. in this conversation <laughs> as well. Um, to be, she was just such a shining light of inspiration. And it was amazing yeah, it was, to see someone so young, She's so um, powerful in her voice and in, in her words. Yeah. Kind of brought me back to Maya Angelou and some of the works that I had loved from mm -hmm. her. Yeah, she's others. another lovely poet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so someone uh, had shared that they also love, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, Sarah Perteski and Kara Black and then Anthony Horowitz. And they had the pleasure of getting to know Ursula Le Guin. Oh, lovely. Yeah, she was, she is, a, was, is a splendid person. She was such an interesting power in the Northwest literature world. I love this. There's so many different things coming in. Well, I'm uh, going to look forward to the mystery reading list I'm going to get out of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And everyone's, you know, some people are talking about um, maybe some ideas of things that they could read to their grandchildren or their children. If uh, you have yes. Suggestions. Someone has a nine-year-old, but there's also, you know, a couple of people with teenagers or things that you might <laughs> suggest to intrigue and entice folks to to fall in love with reading as well well let's see so my my eight-year-old grandson is now deep into the boxcar children mm -hmm. <laughs> reading those um, over and over again they're very rapid um there are um swallows and amazons i'm not going to remember the name of the author i'm sorry but those take place in the lake district basically and they're lovely children exploring the world. <laughs> mm. um, what else? Uh, you always have to read where the wild things are to everybody, even of a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and then, in a, so this is a question that doesn't just go into kind of specific books, but a, a larger kind of question, how would you define good literature? versus uh, maybe something that wouldn't fall under that umbrella? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I have to think about the answer to that one, though. Um, mm -hmm. And I probably, you know, I don't think I could define it in a universal sense. I can, I can work at it from what I look for in literature and so what I think of as... Um, High, 
high level literature. Um, you know, I, I look for a, a voice. I mean, I've, I've read a lot of stuff that isn't this way. So, you know, things can be really funny. I was thinking of Flann O'Brien at Swim Two Birds, which is just hilarious. And it's just a big metafiction farce. And it's fun to read, you know, but I don't go back to those. <laughs> so the, the ones I go back to are the ones that where there's a, a I look for a voice in the author, whether whatever it is, if it's in fiction or nonfiction, I I still want to grow up to be John McPhee because his books are about everything. And he's nonfiction, but he appears all over the library. He's in every library of Congress category. Right. I, I aspire to that. Um I'll never do it, but I aspire to it. Um, but so I'm looking for a voice that's curious, right? I look for a, a voice in the author that's trying not to impose themselves too much <laughs> um, in the way that you're seeing the world. I mean, of course we all do, but I'm trying trying to stay back from that a little bit. That's inquiring. That's um, giving their characters a little space you know, to figure themselves out. And that's interested in um, really big questions. That's not just interested in, you know, um, not just, I mean, you have to analyze power in good literature, but not just interested in gaining or losing power, not interested in just that struggle, but asking questions about it. What does power do to us? How do we use it? How should we not use it? That asks moral questions, really, at some level. Um, I want to learn from them, you know, and, and I I want to be able to see what they're seeing to some extent in the world. So I have to be a little transparent. And I just love I love language, right? I just I I love language. I love <laughs> I love when somebody uses a word I haven't seen before, right? Not not an invented one so much, the made up ones, you know, but if they if they use a really precise word that I'm not familiar with, they've got my okay, right? So I, I love that expansion of language. I've I've always been really interested in translation also for that same reason. Um, translators are really interesting people <laughs> because they have to take a language and try and recreate it in another language, right? while doing honor to the author that's hard <laughs> and there's there's always a little bit of translation even in an english reader for an english text right mm -hmm. because you're you're working across two minds i loved teaching writing throughout my whole academic career i still like um collaborative writing with people in any form now even in my administrative life because working with somebody on a piece of writing is absolutely the best way to begin to understand how their mind works and all the differences in, in the way our brains work, right? And the way we use language and reading always does that. So any good, any good literature for me opens that world of the other person's mind to you to some extent. Yeah. I'm sorry. That was a long answer. <laughs> it, was, it was a great answer in that you talked about, it gives a lot of room for many things to be considered good literature. Oh, absolutely. Or to be spaced within that, I, I mean, everything from someone having a strong voice or to really capture a specific time or place or perspective to, you know, someone being able to translate. I mean, when you speak of translation, the fact that language conveys feelings and little sayings that are very common. And if you don't get it just right, it won't come off the same way in a different language and you'll miss the point and people will be like, why are they talking about shoot? Like, I don't get, you know, because it's just a little comment or something that everyone would get in that native language. But if you translate it just on its surface, you're missing yeah, you miss the it. whole yeah. point, the whole painting. You know, it's it's just, a, it's like paint by numbers gone horribly wrong. And it doesn't look <laughs> like the masterpiece. Um, yeah, don't look exactly. at my Van Gogh behind me kind of deal. <laughs> um but then just also, that, like, I know some of my favorite ones, I really like uh, Mishner novels mm -hmm. because yeah. I'm so fascinated by such an in-depth pull into a specific place through time, through different yeah. characters, through, and some people don't don't have the patience for that or don't want to be right. something for that long where others really enjoy that. And they're, yeah. you know, everyone's looking for something different. Um one of it, Nathan Fry, class of 82, actually shared that he really enjoyed how you helped discuss the psychology 
about what a writer brings to a particular book and how that can also play into the interpretation and, and to the discussion around it as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I went through a whole phase of my reading life where I was fascinated by the authors almost more than the books. And, and you know, the, and there's a whole breed of criticism actually that's biographical that looks at the lives of the authors so my my uh, dissertation work for my phd was on samuel beckett and it was essentially looking at his life as much as or more than looking at his works right so trying to figure out what what experience a novel grows out of right and and looking back into the psychology of the author or the psychology of the characters that they create is really fascinating yeah I, i've i spent a lot of time reading psychologists carl jung was a, my my favorite go-to crazy as he is <laughs> my favorite go-to person for quite a while <laughs> so yeah but I, it so ties into kind of some of the things you like, where if you think about it, here he is coming up with ways to categorize people and personalities. Absolutely. And I, so I've, I've course, done I've done that over and over again. <laughs> I'm just saying you have your own themes that kind of come through where it's, you know, we've all taken those tests or, you know, different <laughs> things and no letters or whichever things it is. And um, and if they're written in such a way where it can be loose enough to fit most people, it, it can yeah. kind of help. Yeah. But I just yeah. love the fact that you keep finding these ways of different labels or boxes or, or uh, <laughs> methods of thinking. And, and, and none of them are right, by the way. I mean, none <laughs> of them really do the job, but it's fascinating to try. <laughs> but, but I think that's what you love is the idea that someone t- made an attempt and then you kind of get to see what they were thinking and how disordered or great that was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe why it shouldn't be taken. Exactly. Um, <laughs> someone so there's a couple of other things that people have shared uh that they've read recently matrix by lauren groff excellent yes yeah that's a very good puzzle structure piece <laughs> <laughs> and then we have flights by i'm gonna hopefully not mess this up olga toker kruska no, I don't know I don't know that one this is another thing I have to read clearly yeah, transition or uh transition from Polish ah um, yes yes okay I hope I'm messing these up terribly and then we have some science fiction and fantasy fans as well and Excellent. someone shared the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Oh. Uh, Jemison. so yes yeah that's a great one yeah this is I mean we have about eight minutes left so if other people have other questions that they would like to share their favorite loves, of course, and we will, I will be collecting all of these and share both the attendees <laughs> we'll have a great reading list together. <laughs> and then uh, Provost Longs as well. Um, <laughs> I, I just love, you know, it's one of the gifts of language of being a reader is that everyone can bring with it different things, take away from it different things. Um, yeah. You know, once you learn how to read, you can keep improving upon it and and have that relationship and have that time and, and that intention set. Absolutely. Or you can drop a book and then pick up a different one. Or maybe right. you only read at the beach on vacation or <laughs> it becomes yeah. your career and you get to talk about books you love or that you don't like all day long. with bunches yeah. Of- yeah, no, it's a great it's a great gift. It is a great gift. You know, one of the things that's always interested me, too, is the relationship between, among the arts. And as we've had the Pacific Northwest College of Art becoming part of Willamette, we've had the opportunity to talk more broadly with a whole lot of visual artists. Um, but thinking about, you know, music is something that has been um, brought into, described, um, related to literature for a long time. Um, and visual arts as well, but I've always been interested in the the rhythm of music and in relationship to fiction, right? Mm-hmm. And a sort of comparison structurally of those different arts. Um, I know that um, I don't. Let's see. I, uh, Ginny Furtwangler, who was a, a writer in residence at Willamette for a number of years, some of you may have worked with her. Um, but she was also a pianist. And so her most recent publication was really about her life in music and how that integrated with her literary and writing life. Um, so thinking about integrated arts has always been kind of fascinating to me as well. And then there are you know, graphic novels, um, ways that the visual arts interact with narrative and story um, and with the 
technology that we're gaining today, you know, a much more integrated approach to aesthetic expression is really possible. So I, I expect great things out of the 21st century. <laughs> well, and I, I love that as well, because you can think of, you know, the difference between Ernest Hemingway and these short, tight, very specific sentences and the energy and the masculinity, you know, that that just gives you in no time yeah. for nonsense and the vocabulary that's used versus Jane Austen or so, you know, <laughs> that's much longer and uses all these yes. wonderful adjectives and can't get enough of them yeah. and is doing all these subtleties of expression and, and social norms and mannerisms and that Ernest Hemingway would have never been bothered with. <laughs> Didn't seem real important to him. <laughs> no, but just the, the expansiveness there and the, the differences and how they appeal to different folks and, and different moods right. as well. Well, and just, um, the, just the syntax and language of a novel, you know, compare Henry James to <laughs> Hemingway, for instance, but, but those very long sentences, which are just not at all the mode right now, right? Where we, we speak in social media and text, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, working working through that kind of rhythmic difference mm -hmm. in the in the pattern of thought in some of these different authors is really fascinating too. I, I love that. And someone was, you know, talking about studying Chaucer with uh, oh. Professor uh, Birnbaum. Runebaum, right? Oh, Adele, okay. yeah, wonderful yeah. colleague, <laughs> and, and others. Um, and so, one question here that's wonderful: as a teacher, how do you convert, in quotes, possibly a reluctant reader? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Very good question. Well, you know, I've I've had a, a lot of experience with that, both professionally and otherwise. Um, I think telling a story, right, and getting people particularly young younger people you know getting getting people connected to narrative as a form will lead them into reading short things and then building out from that um, I think with older readers who are you know maybe just maybe don't see the benefit or the the reward of reading a 900 page novel for instance <laughs> I'm not sure I get everybody to the 900 page novel stage but um, I think just giving them some element of understanding of what comes out of the book, right, in terms of meaning for someone's life or understanding of a situation or a challenge or how um, a character might provide a solution to somebody's own life in a small way. I mean, mm -hmm. kind of getting that visible as a usefulness, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't think literature is useful, right? Yeah. <laughs> so getting people persuaded that it's useful <laughs> is, I, I think, one strategy. Also, I think, you know, there I've, as I say, I'm a pretty omnivorous reader. I'll read almost anything. Um, <laughs> and so I can't deal with real violence in, in movies very well. I don't, I don't like it there. I'll walk away from it. I can deal with it much better in language, right? So like John Hawks or people like that who who portray um, really challenging events, but in absolutely beautiful control language, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those kinds of things I can I can deal with better. I can I can deal with more in the written word than I can in. I mean, I'm and I don't mean everybody's like that. I'm probably weird, but <laughs> for me, <laughs> the the. Mm, what the the tool of language yeah. allows me to do to reach further right yeah. than I can in some of the other arts. Music is also that way for me. I mean, music is very I can deal with a lot there. But the visual for me is maybe it's just that it's more powerful in some ways. Mm -hmm. But there are things I don't want to deal with in a visual way that I can deal with in a literary way and still allow me to understand and reach into those events at some level, right? Well, and I think different senses are confronted in different ways. My own training as a social worker, when you think of the, the written word or the power of narrative, especially someone's own narrative within yeah. a therapeutic space and process yeah. and how that, you know, they, they have, um, especially for folks experiencing complex PTSD, they'll be writing workshops or, or yes. putting on small plays and vignettes and, and role playing in different ways and engaging with language written, spoken aloud, 
their own poetry yeah. as a way to process human experience and reality and painful experiences yeah. or emotions, but in a way to kind of knit together a more mm-hmm. integrated whole and yeah. then be able to, to kind of bring yourself forward yeah, in, a, in a better way. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, we've been talking about reading. We could have a whole other session on writing. <laughs> I, know. I know. And I want to share, because um, we only have a, a minute or two left and we'll do a wrap up. But one of my favorite quotes about reading um, that I put in the chat, at one magical instant in your early childhood, the page of a book, that string of confused alien ciphers shivered into meaning. Words spoke to you, gave up their secrets. At that moment, whole universes opened. You became irrevocably a reader. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> That's kind of the keys to the kingdom because my mom let me loose in the library as well and let me, kind of, you know, read whatever I wanted and, and uh, share that as well. So it wasn't I know that a gift? Just I know. allowing to choose any old book. <laughs> the, and the freedom. And, and I think she just knew how important that was. And it became a family practice where we had library days. And we were so yep. excited to be able yep. to be in those spaces. And they're some of the few public spaces that anyone can go into now. That's right. Just how yeah. important That's that right. is. Um, I know we're, we're about at time. So before we wrap up, final question, is there anything else you kind of want to share with the audience or leave us with as we... Oh, goodness. Well, just <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for being here and for continuing to be readers. <laughs> I hope you'll send us all the titles that you love so I can read them all too. Um, and I hope you pick up a few of these books that you haven't read. Maybe. <laughs> and one final thing, is there a favorite... Um, bookstore in Salem or the area that you go to when we think oh about well you know I worry about Powell's <laughs> <laughs> we, yes Powell's has been a special uh, I mean it is a remarkable there are lots of remarkable bookstores mm-hmm. in the world and alas you know I, I I I do my fair share of ordering from Amazon but I, I try to order my books from Powell's when I can <laughs> just because I want I want them to stay in business and the pandemic has had such an impact on their public space, right? Which has been so vital and so important for the Northwest for a long time. So that's my favorite. Yeah. But they're all wonderful. I love used bookstores, you know. Mm-hmm. The, someone I, shared I love the Powell's because it's both. <laughs> yes, true. And someone shared the book bin and some other ones. Oh yeah, so. book bin is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my, my husband ran a bookstore in Salem for five years. So I sat at the desk in a bookstore off and on for a while. It's a wonderful business and I, I hope it I hope it survives and thrives through the 21st century. <laughs> well, we'll all do our best in getting all these new books added to our list <laughs> and supporting small businesses in the written word in that way. With that, Provost Long, thank you so much for sharing your perspective, your time with us, this great, rambling, wonderful conversation. We will share these community created and, and beloved lists and Um, Everyone will have more things to to take away. And for those of you who joined us this evening, we appreciate your time and intention. We hope that you'll continue to tune into Stream, your Willamette programming. And with that, we hope you're staying safe and healthy with you and yours. And we hope you have a lovely night.